So huge sections of the global economy can't function or, or function very badly in a negative interest rate environment. Oh, oh, and, and insurance companies and pension funds basically are designed to make a certain amount of money on their investments, on, on what their, their customers pay in, in order to pay off the, uh, um, the obligations that they've created in out years. And if bonds are yielding next to nothing or less than nothing, then that part of their portfolio doesn't earn enough for them to be able to meet their obligations. And so their business model implodes. And so pension funds, insurance companies, big banks, retirees, you know, everybody um, I just maimed is, is being hurt by low and negative interest rates. And that's all very deflationary. So the governments of the world are getting exactly the opposite of what they were hoping for by cutting interest rates to these, you know, historically incredibly low levels. They're, they're actually getting deflation instead of inflation. And you see that around the world. The, uh, the inflation rate in the Eurozone is effectively zero. And it's probably going to go down for there, from there post Brexit because it's, um, um, causing so much uncertainty now um, that the economy of, uh, of of most of the eurozone and the EU is slowing down, you know. So that's deflationary. Japan um, cut interest rates to negative levels and increased government spending to record levels, and that didn't work. They've got deflation. The last couple of inflation reports have been negative, and their economy isn't growing at all. Um, and really only the U.S. looks like it's reporting kind of somewhat normal numbers. And that, that's really an illusion. We can't um, continue to behave normally in a world where everybody else is in this twilight zone of negative interest rates. So what could very possibly happen going forward in the U.S. is that all this terrified capital that's out there in China and Japan and Europe and Latin America that doesn't want to stay home, you know, it doesn't trust the local system to continue to function normally, um, is going to flow into the U.S. And that's already pushing U.S. Treasury yields down to record levels this morning. So if that continues, then our rates head towards zero and maybe turn negative in, in some cases, some parts of the yield curve. And so we then inherit a lot of the pathologies that the rest of the world is suffering from today. So I, I don't really see how it ends because no policy is being reversed. You know, the things that brought us here are going just as strong as ever. Governments are borrowing more and more money year after year, and they're encouraging their citizens somehow to borrow more and more money. And um, they're increasing regulation, which is slowing down um, the capital formation around the world and, and the debts that have been taking on in the past are starting to blow up in a lot of cases. For instance, this morning, um, the Italian banking system <laughs> seems to be imploding. One of the big banks um, there has halted trading. And so as these rolling crises spread around the world, the central banks of the world and the governments of the world really only have this one response. They've really only got easy money. That's the only thing they know how to do in the face of trouble. And so they're just going to ramp it up. You know, they're, they're going to increase the QE programs, for instance, around the world. They'll buy back even more debt um, via the central bank with newly created currency and um, push interest rates down even further because that's all they know how to do. But that hasn't worked. You know, we're into the, um, the realm of kind of a mirror image Keynesianism now where the things that used to work actually hurt you. And yet we're going to continue to do that. So it looks like bad government policy is going to continue at the same time that Brexit, the, uh, the UK's vote to leave the European Union has set off a chain reaction of other countries in the European Union wanting to do the same thing, you know. So uh, we're going to see political turmoil on an ongoing basis as each new election becomes a referendum on that country's um, membership in the European Union and the Eurozone. And France is the big one. Watch, watch for that because they're 
most popular individual politician, Marine Le Pen, is anti-Euro and anti-EU. And so if she gets enough votes in the next election to actually have any power, then France becomes the next Brexit candidate, only in that case it's Frexit. And that's much bigger than the UK because France is so central to the European Union. Um, so you've got all these things looming out there, either bad policy in the moment or a crisis that's looming in somebody's banking system or a political crisis that uh, that is as of a certain date when the election is held, you know, leading up to that, um, there's uncertainty. All of this stuff is combining to create massive, massive uncertainty and massive mistrust on the part of individual economic actors in the big systems that they used to count on. So you throw all that together into the mix and you get the potential for chaos. There's no real way to know what causes what on what date because there's just so much stuff going on. Oh, and then of course there's geopolitics where the Middle East is still on fire and the US and China are sending battleships and, and um, jets to kind of bump into each other in the South China Sea and, and it just goes on and on. And so we're entering a time in which the old systems don't work anymore. We have no idea what to replace them with. And this transition period, it has everybody terrified. So hot money is flowing everywhere and causing even more, um, more discord around the world. And the question is, at what point does the global chaos spread to the U.S.? And, and you know, I, I think there's a good chance that uh, 2017 is a year in which the U.S. catches the bug that everybody else has. And so um, it. The question really is, does, is that good for U.S. financial assets? In other words, does all this hot money flowing in push up our stock and bond prices? Or is it bad because the uncertainty terrifies everybody and sends them into real assets? In other words, do we all buy farmland and oil wells and gold and silver and dump our financial assets because we don't trust the currencies that underpin those financial assets? And I think that's up in the air right now. You know, it could be that all the terrified global capital flows in and, and gives us kind of a normal bull market-ish financial system in the U.S. for another year or two. Or it could be that it all blows up on us right away. There's really no way to know, you know, and, and um, we found out how fast things changed just lately in the precious metals market where gold and silver were beaten down and they were in a long bear market. and. The uh, the mining stocks were just the worst investment of the last two or three years, and nobody wanted to touch them. And then in the space of six months here in in the U.S., a lot of them quadrupled, tripled. You know, the the mining stocks just took off because gold and silver seemed to have bottomed and then popped a bit. Uh, and so, if you weren't there, you know, if you hadn't placed your bet already, you missed a quadrupling in some of your favorite stocks. And I think the same thing is going to be true at some point in U.S. financial assets in general. Um, you're going to want to be short. And the question is, do we have to do it now, even with all the uncertainty and the possibilities that we have another big up leg in equities and, and bond prices ahead of us? Or can we wait? And I, I think the gold and silver experience indicates that waiting is dangerous because you miss that big move. You know, let's say an Italian bank goes bust over overnight, you know, when, when the US market is closed and that sets off a chain reaction throughout the European banking system. And then we wake up with the Dow down 15% at the open. And uh, so anything you were trying to short, you've missed a big move there. So that's the kind of thing that we're risking now in a world where there's this much uncertainty. It makes trading very hard. It makes entry points hard to figure out. But not acting is still acting. You know, if we choose not to do anything and just watch, that's still a choice. And none of these choices are especially attractive right now from a risk return point of view. Now, I'd like to get back a little bit about how you're saying we're going into this transition period. You've talked about how negative interest rates, basically no area of finance 
will function normally if rates stay low or negative. And basically that we have to move to a new system. Did you want to discuss a little bit why no area of finance can function normally with low or negative interest rates? Um, yeah, because it, it distorts so many business models out there. For instance, uh, you know, as, as I said, if you're an insurance company or a pension fund, you can't function. Your, your business model literally doesn't work if interest rates are negative or even if they're close to zero. And so you just have big sections of the financial system now that no longer function normally and can no longer make money. And the financialization of the, the global economy is really a 30 year process that has culminated just lately where um, the banks got bigger and more powerful year after year after year because we artificially reduced interest rates and create, created huge amounts of new currency which flowed to the banks first. So it gave the banks incredible power, made them extremely profitable and uh, allowed them to become the dominant part of the global economy. So now if we reach the point where the opposite is true, where policies are um, dangerous for the big banks and for current policy to continue and progress along its, its current course, is, is existentially threatening for a lot of these big banks, then we have a huge problem on our hands because um, all of a sudden, what is arguably the most important sector of the economy is in danger of blowing up on us. And so that happened to an extent in 2008, 2009, when the derivatives books of the big banks were going to blow up if the US government didn't bail them out. You know, we had to throw trillions of dollars at AIG, the big insurance company that was a big derivatives player, and Wall Street um, to keep the, the big names, you know, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, they would have ceased to exist if the government didn't bail out the derivatives market. Well, we've made things even worse and more dangerous in the meantime. The derivatives books of the big banks are even bigger. Deutsche Bank alone has a derivatives book that is several times the size of the entire German economy. So in that kind of a circumstance, when these big banks are so systemically important and potentially dangerous, and for us to be pursuing economic policies that hurt the big banks and you know threaten the existence of a lot of them and threaten via a few bank failures, the rest of the banking system, um, for us to be doing that and to be continuing along that path creates the conditions in which we could see a banking crisis that is just unprecedented, you know, because it's going to be global. And that's really the conditions that we've created out there. And so now it's just waiting a catalyst. Uh, in other words, something has to happen to knock a, a domino down which knocks another domino down and then starts this cascade failure of the global financial system. And it could have been Brexit. You know, we, we still don't know because that sent a shockwave through the global financial system and it's still reverberating around. And it might be Frexit. Maybe France has to do it. Maybe the Italian banking system has to blow up. Maybe the, the Japanese financial markets have to freeze up. Any of those things are possible. China, you know, has um, taken on more debt in five years than any other country in history. And they've got a full on credit crisis going under the surface there now. So they could blow up. <laughs> and any of these things in and of themselves would be manageable in normal times. But these aren't normal times. We're incredibly fragile right now. So the banking system is looking at, you know, a lot of different um, swords hanging over its head and any one of those swords could drop and cause a full on financial crisis that spins out of control and goes around the world. And that's where we are now. And you can trace the, the cause of it back to the fact that we've been pushing interest rates down for such a long time. And now we've reached the point where it not only doesn't work anymore, but it actually causes more trouble than it solves. And we don't have any other solution. We're going to continue to do that, apparently. You know, Switzerland has negative interest rates all the way out to 50 years on their yield curve. Every single Swiss bond now is trading at a negative yield. 
And Japan and Germany are heading that way fast. So in that kind of an environment, all bets are really off. You know, there's just no way to know what the outcome is going to be, but the early indications are that it's going to be really seriously bad for almost everybody. So do you see that this correction is basically just going to be a free market correction? I mean, you've talked about before about how there's this self-correcting mechanism in the market. Do you see that this self-correction is going to be the big collapse that we've been talking about for so long? Oh, who knows? See, we can't know um, whether this is the big one until after the fact or until we're in the middle of it, because, you know, you have so many false alarms in this kind of an environment where something blows up and, and it looks like it's the end of the world. And then and then some central bank steps in with huge amounts of new liquidity. And a week later, you're back in a equities and bond bull market. You know, and that's happened over and over and over again, especially if you include 2008, 2009, you know, that looked like the end of the world for a few days. We were days away from martial law in, in the U.S., uh, according to what the bankers to told poor George W. Bush <laughs> before he, he caved and bailed them all out. Um, and stuff like that happens over and over again in a system that this that is this highly leveraged. And so we can't know whether any individual crisis is the catalyst for a broader global financial crisis until it happens, you know, until you end up in that crisis. And that's what's so stressful for anybody trying to manage money right now. Um, you know, you can't know whether you need to go totally risk off or totally risk on or do something in the middle and just hope to survive and and you won't know until after the fact whether any of those decisions were correct and so you're kind of stuck these just aren't normal times and and so that's why so many hedge funds are reporting horrible numbers and so many of them are just flat out closing because even for supposedly extremely smart money managers which are you know generally considered to be the hedge fund guys are generally considered to be the smartest money managers out there why it's impossible in a lot of cases to figure out what to do and at the same time you've got all this fragility out there, you've got governments actively manipulating all the different markets. Um, the bond market is, of course, completely manipulated by central banks, buying up all the supply of government bonds being issued. The equity markets are manipulated by central banks buying ETFs and, and other equities. You know, you look at what the Swiss bank, Swiss central bank owns, and they're one of the biggest shareholders in Apple, among many other, you know, US blue chips. And Japan owns over 50% of the ETFs in the Japanese stock market. So if you're trying to allocate capital in the private sector, um, you find that there are no real markets anymore in the sense of um, prices responding to actual reality in the capital markets and in the industrial markets because you've got governments creating huge amounts of new currency and just randomly distorting these markets in ways that destroy the price signaling mechanism um, of traditional markets. And so when there's no accurate way to gauge via prices where capital should be allocated, you get random capital allocation and mis misallocation of capital and malinvestment around the world. And in other words, lots of things being built and created and invested in that will never pay off, never create enough cash flow in order to cover the debts that were taken on to build them. And, you know, that's true in China, of course. And it's also true around the world where capital is so misallocated now that, um, that, that you are guaranteed deflationary debt driven recessions almost everywhere in the world, unless governments create a huge amount of new currency and try to reliquify these markets. And, and so, yeah, there, there are no fully functioning markets out there anymore. Capital is being misallocated on a, a vast, vast, unprecedented scale. 
And that just makes us that much more fragile. You know, it, it keeps getting more and more scary out there from almost any angle that you want to look at. And I don't see an end to it until something blows up uh, and until market forces reassert themselves. And that can only happen through some kind of a, a epic crisis. So whether it's this year, next year, or five years from now, uh, who knows? But what's coming is going to be very big and very terrifying for most people. And it's going to ruin a lot of lives. And the sad thing is that it never really had to happen. You know, we could have controlled our finances starting in, for instance, the 1990s when the, the governments of the world had a, a fair bit of tax revenue coming in and could easily have scaled back their own spending and, and brought the needs of Medicare and Social Security and the other kinds of pension plans around the world that correspond to those things um, into some kind of um, path that was sustainable. But we didn't do any of that. You know, we just encouraged the private sector to keep on borrowing and then the government kept on borrowing and, and we just took on more and more debt until it's unfixable now. And so we're so far past the point of no return that only a crisis resolves this. And when the crisis comes, it's, you know, it's going to have to get rid of two thirds of the debt that exists in the world right now. We've never had to do anything like that on a global basis before. A lot of countries have gone through depressions that lowered the level of debt in the system to the point where they could start to grow sustainably again, but, but it's never happened globally before. So this is such uncharted territory that all you can really say is that something bad is coming, but you can't really speak in terms of details because we don't have any historical precedents to let us know that this is going to proceed in a certain way. Um, we're just going to make history as we go along, and it's going to be really ugly, really scary history. Now, you're saying two-thirds of all debt has to be erased, is, if I'm uh, hearing you correctly. Yeah. So how do you see that happening? And do you see just like a lot of defaults happening or just governments inflating their currency and then the value of the debt uh, falling? Or how do you see that happening? Well, de debt can only be erased in one of three ways. One is you grow fast enough to create a lot of new wealth which then can be used to pay off debt. That's not possible now because we found out that negative interest rates are actually deflationary. They actually slow, slow you down. So there's nothing left in the toolbox of central banks and governments that will allow them to grow at a rate that will take care of this debt. Um, the other two ways are, as you said, have a depression in which everybody goes bankrupt, defaults on their debt, and the debt is wiped out that way, um, which happened in the 1930s, could happen again, or inflate away the currency so that you're paying off your debts in much, much cheaper currency. And in that way, you're at least able to pay off your debts. But that just crushes the entire part of the economy that trusted you. You know, everybody who saved in your local national currency um, is wiped out by that kind of a, you know, Weimar Germany hyperinflation. And so basically we're left with the 1930s style depression, only much bigger because it's global, or a Weimar Germany style hyperinflation worldwide. And that's it. <laughs> you know, Jim Rickards has a, a scenario that, that seems like the least painful way that this can go. And um, he says everybody's going to figure out that the only thing you can really devalue against is gold. So we, we devalue our currencies versus gold by 70, 80%. In other words, gold goes to $10,000 an ounce. And then we adopt some kind of a gold standard going forward. So we've got um, a, a sustainable monetary system in the future. But in the meantime, that burst of inflation the fact that we devalued our currencies so dramatically means that everybody that, that's holding those currencies is hurt really badly. If you're a retiree and you've got $50,000 in a bank account or a money market fund, now you've got purchasing power equal to, let's say, 10% of what you had before. And so 
it, it becomes questionable whether if, you know, if that was enough money to retire on and survive before, if it's now only worth 10% as much, um, how do you eat? And so worldwide, we're going to see that with the people who trusted the system and who saved in the local currency uh, being really, really badly hurt. And what's so despicable about this is that they're the people who are who least deserve it because they are playing by the rules and they're doing what they've been told is the right thing to do, you know, save money, put it away in a safe place and and then live off of it later in life. So you're not a burden on your family or on society. And um, they're really, really being hurt by this. And meanwhile, the uh, the speculators who are able to see this coming stand to make a ton of money. You know, the George Soros's of the world and Carl Icahn's will get even richer because they understand what's coming. And they're what, what they're doing right now is shorting stocks and buying gold. And that's exactly the right move in a time of extreme political and financial turmoil. The average person doesn't completely get that yet. I think they're still um, you know, putting money away, they're holding cash, they're holding bank accounts, they're holding money market funds, they're holding bond funds. And, and these are the things that will get crushed in that kind of a devaluation. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's a really, really ugly scenario for the people who least deserve to be hurt. And I think historians are going to be very, very hard on the guys who are in charge right now, because this is the kind of thing that isn't a mystery. You should be able to see this coming if you've got access to government statistics. When you just run a chart of debt to GDP that's soaring parabolically, um, that's the kind of thing that uh, that you as the person in charge of a central bank or a, a government treasury should be able to see and then take steps to moderate, right? But nobody's doing that. And so they're putting their own political careers ahead of the welfare of their constituents. And hopefully this comes out and it's understood in the future. And the, you know, the Bernankes and the Greenspans and the, uh, the Bushes and the Clintons of the world uh, pay some kind of a price for their gross mismanagement of the global financial system. Now, I guess, what would be your opinion on how people can prepare? I know we've discussed this before, but for our new viewers, what do you think is the best way to prepare so people aren't hurt financially as much? Well, you, you want to get out of financial. Okay, assuming that it's the inflation scenario that takes place. And uh, I think governments are still trying to engineer that. So let's say they succeed, succeed and manage to um, inflate away their currencies in a dr really dramatic way. Well, you want to own real assets, things governments can't just make more of on an electronic printing press. And for the average person, that's gold and silver. Um, and we've seen what they do in times of crisis. They soared from 2008 to 2012. And um, now they're going back up again. So that's one thing you can do. Although, again, waiting too long is a dangerous thing in this kind of a market because there, there will come a time when there just aren't silver coins, for instance, available from the mints and from the coin dealers that you would normally buy from. And you're going to have to give them your money and then wait six weeks or two months or whatever before you get your silver coins. And that's going to be a really stressful couple of months. <laughs> so uh, it's the kind of thing that you, you almost have to just bite the bullet and do now to uh, to guarantee that you're ready when the big move happens. And other things you can buy that historically have done well in this kind of an environment are well-chosen real estate. You know, the government can't make more beachfront condos or really well-positioned, well-maintained rental properties, things like that. That that has traditionally done all right and held its value. And um, energy related assets have also done pretty well in the long run. For instance, we, we can't make more oil yet. And solar farms, there are things that are called yield co's, which are basically ETFs that own 
um, solar um, farms, okay, and 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 give you back the cash flow that those things generate, and that's probably a reasonable kind of um, fairly solid investment that pays a fairly decent income going forward. Uh, so there are things you can do, but there aren't that many. You know, this is the kind of volatile marketplace where. What a, uh, a traditional financial planner will put you in, in other words, a um, an age-based mix of blue chip equities and international equities and government bonds and corporate bonds and cash. That mix is at extreme risk to the uncertainty that's going to flow from the bad policies that we're seeing around us now. So either way. You know, in, in a depression or in a spike in inflation, traditional financial portfolios are not going to do as well as they have done in the past. And in some cases, they're going to be catastrophically bad places to put your money. So it's tough. You know, it, it's it's tough because the conventional wisdom, which is what most people still listen to, is breaking down. And a lot of people, most people probably, aren't going to figure this out until it's too late. You know, they're going to have to suffer before they actually dig into the details of what's going on. And so, yeah, um, I think probably the best thing you can do is right now just go buy some silver coins and uh, accept that maybe it goes down in the short run, but you're protected in the long run from the kind of crisis that is very possibly coming.